welcome back to part no, part two of this week's episode. And we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Holy cow, do we have a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, we were actually just prepping to start recording the second session, second part, and we saw some breaking news from our good friends at Caltech. That's right. George Zimmerman visits Caltech plant, scopes out the new high-capacity magazine is the headline of the press release news story there. Yes, as a lot of you guys may know, uh, we talked about the Zimmerman story. We really didn't get into the specifics of the hardware he used, uh, but he did use a P. He was carrying a PF9 Celtic pistol that night, and uh, so you know, I talked to uh, my buddy Derek down at Celtic uh, uh, when this first. Actually, it was a year ago shot show, uh, like the 2012 shot show. I talked to him about it, and because things were just starting to heat up with this then, and I said, you know, what are your thoughts about it? And he said, well. He said, people that don't like guns and don't like Caltech, it's not really, you know, this this story isn't going to change their opinion. You know, it's not like they're going to say, oh, I didn't like guns before, but now all of a sudden I do. So it's it's not really, he said it really didn't hurt us because you know, we got a lot of, he said, we got a lot of phone calls and, and silly crap from, from news people wanting to know about this super deadly PF9 Caltech pistol. <laughs> And it was probably the first time in the history of the company that the that the PF9 compact pocket pistol from Keltec was accused of being this overly deadly monster tool. It's kind of funny, you know. But yeah, there's a uh, if you go to uh, guns.com, you can you can check out the story, but we just uh, just got this story right as we were getting ready to uh put this episode together. So we thought, "Hey, let's go ahead and, you know, Keltex are they're our buddies and uh, we thought we'd talk about it, but they weren't actually focusing on the uh, PF9 pistol down there. Apparently, uh, they let George take a look at the Keltec KSG shotgun and he was pretty excited about it. Uh so where have you heard about a Keltec KSG shotgun before? I don't know, maybe student of the gun, maybe you, one of you lucky winners out there, one of you lucky listeners will be a lucky winner. It, hey, it's got to be somebody, right? And it's better than the chances of winning the uh, New Mexico State Lottery, right? It's a lot better. So uh, we just thought we we thought it was kind of a cool little story, and we just decided to drop that in. So uh, George Zimmerman visits the Caltech factory, checks out the KSG. And you could be owner an owner of one of those if you just go to studentofthegun.com, right, Jared? What do they have to do? If you go to studentofthegun.com and sign up, we've got a newsletter thingy right there. It's red. It's bright red. You can't miss it. Uh, put your name and your email in there, and we will be, enter you into a drawing to win that KSG and some accessories as well. That's right. So, all right, but the uh, the name of this uh, this segment is called Take Your Gun to Dinner. And there's a reason that we say take your gun to dinner. Remember, we talked about you know, during the first the first uh, segment, uh, first part one of this week's episode, that we don't carry guns because we're planning to have to use them. We carry guns because we don't know if we're going to have to use them. That is the whole point. And uh, we uh, we've got several stories that that kind of back this up. And you know, a lot of folks out there. Yeah, uh, a lot of concealed carry permit holders, what they'll do is they'll talk themselves out of carrying because they want to be a reasonable person. They don't want their peers or their friends or whatever, or even their relatives or wives or husbands to think that they're paranoid. So when they, you know, they get ready to leave the house and they see their pistol laying there on the dresser or they get up in the morning and they're like, well... I probably won't need that today, so I'm not going to put it on. Well, this the uh, the cup the family in this first story here probably didn't think that going to a Burger King in the middle of the day to have lunch was going to be a situation that required deadly force. But guess what? It was. And uh, the dateline is Miami, Florida. A family was in a Burger King in the middle of the day. When uh, two bad men, two nasty felon type people who had been in the process of stealing and robbing uh, all day long decided, well, hey, I bet there's people in Burger King that got money. I'm just going to go in there and rob them. So here's, you know, Mr. and Mrs. America sitting, having their whoppers, you know, they're having it their way at the Burger King. And uh, Joe Scumbag walks up to him in the freaking crowded dining room 
points a gun at him and says, give me your phone, give me your money. What? Admit it, dads. How many of you guys out there have taken the little crumb crunchers out to get their BK? You're munching out some cheeseburgers or some nuggets or whatever. How many of you thought at that moment in the middle of a crowded restaurant that some deranged piece of human filth was going to walk up to you, stick a gun in your face and tell you that he wants your cell phone and your wallet or your watch or whatever. Really? Probably. You're probably thinking, ah, come on. I, you know, Paul, what are you, you paranoid? You're crazy. You know, what do you think is going to happen? What, what, why do you think you need to have a gun? Well, I don't think I need to have one. I don't think I need to have a fire extinguisher. I don't think I need to have a first aid kit, but I've got them just in case. And in this situation in Miami, well, what the dad did is he drew his own gun and said, I don't think so. And he shot the bad guy. That's right. He shot the bad guy. Now, the bad guy didn't die, unfortunately, but him and his partner were arrested and they'll do a little bit of time in jail before they get out and get back to robbing people. So uh, and probably actually by the time you hear this, these two guys will already have been released from jail in uh, Florida and will be back out on the streets patrolling, uh, looking for people to rob. So keep a close eye out for those guys, for the Burger King robbers, because I'm sure they're in a neighborhood near you down there in Miami. Now, the uh, next story, this one has gotten a lot of play. This one is comes from a Denny's in Houston, and it turned out that a woman was in a – and if you're a, a, a Facebooker or Reddit or, or whatever, if you're a computer social networking type of dude, you probably heard about this. But it happened, uh, Dateline Houston, Texas, uh, says a woman opens fire on group of robbers at local Denny's restaurant. Now, this was this was in the middle of the day one. This is around 4 a.m. It said his brother was robbed by six men. And it says, here's according to the story, and this comes out of uh, – HoustonNews.com. Okay, click to HoustonNews.com. And it says, uh, around 4 a.m. Thursday, a man who does not want to be identified says his brother was robbed by six men with guns at a Denny's in, just at the, on the Gulf Freeway in Houston. Uh, I don't know if it was random or they set him up, blah, blah, blah. It says his brother's wife was in the restaurant at the time, but when she exited the restaurant and saw the group, uh, <clears throat> saw the group of suspects, then she pulled out her own gun and shot at them. That's right. So we've got the woman, the wife, coming to the rescue here. And uh, a lot of people in Houston in the area are applauding her and applauding her. She said she has a license to carry a concealed handgun, and she does it so that she can protect her kids. And uh, we are all about that here at Student of the Gun, and we applaud that, and we applaud her fortitude for actually carrying a gun with her because how many people do you know out there? You may be one of them, and if you are, shame on you. One of those those people that talk themselves, they, they get their concealed carry permits or they own a gun or whatever, but they talk themselves out of it. Oh, I'm just going to run up to get some milk or oh, we're just going to go out to the restaurant or oh, we're, just gonna, we're only going to do this or we're only going to do that. I won't need a gun there. Okay, well, if you knew you were going to need a gun, it would probably be a bad idea to go there in the first place. So, you know, the title of this is Take Your Gun to Dinner. Now, the first two stories that we uh, that we um, re- replied, or I'm sorry, the first two stories that we reviewed for you guys were Go Team and, uh, you know, the armed good guy wins. Fight back and live. And that's what these people did. They fought back. And they lived, and we applaud them. The next story that we're going to talk about, this is the opposite. If you listen to the Brady campaign, if you listen to uh, any of the ninnies on CNN or the or the mainstream news media, if you listen to uh, Nanny Bloomberg, uh, whose, whose own cops can stand by and watch you be slashed up with a knife, and then they come by and say, well, they can't be held liable because they don't have any, uh, they have no duty to protect you. So, oh, well. So, uh, you know, in, in Nanny Bloomberg's world, you should be disarmed and the police don't have any special duty to protect you. I don't, I don't even know how to define that. And they'll tell you things like, well, if confronted, just give them what they want and they'll leave you alone. So they can 
move along their way and, you know, harass other people too? Well, yeah, you've got that. We've got the, uh, so if you just submit like a good little sheep, what, what you're doing is you're reinforcing their bad behavior. Think about that for a second. You know, if you if you go the reasonable man route and you're confronted and you decide, well, I, I decided not to be armed and I decided to be, you know, like Mr. Passive and do what Sarah Brady says and just give them what they want. So you do that. And let's say you're fortunate and you don't get raped, murdered, you know, beaten to death, what have you. You luck out. Right. Well, what did you just do? To for that felon, for that scumbag, that robber, that piece of human filth, what you just did was you reinforced that behavior. This is not a joke, folks. This is the way it works. This is the way human nature is, the way the human psyche works. What you just told that guy is, hey, you should keep on doing this because guess what? It works. And I don't mean to reference Spider-Man, but Spider-Man let that guy go. And what did he do? He wouldn't kill his uncle, right? All right. That guy could leave you after he robs you and go kill your uncle, Uncle Ben or uh, or Aunt May. But, uh, no, seriously, you are reinforcing that behavior. And uh, this story here comes, this, it's a little bit dated, but I've told this story. Uh, I've related it a number of times. And, and the reason that I've related this story is because it is so horrific and it is an it is a perfect example of what happens when you follow the rules of the ninnies, when you take the advice of the people, when you take advice from people that have 24-hour bodyguards, that have secret service protection, when you, when you go ahead and take personal defense advice from people who've never actually had to defend themselves, who use your tax money to pay for people to defend them, when you take your advice from them, this is what happens to you. Uh, this actually happened at a Cracker Barrel restaurant in uh, Florida, in Naples, Florida, uh, not too far from where I used to live in Sarasota. And what happened was a former employee who was a scumbag and uh, one of his buddies showed up at the Cracker Barrel and got inside and there was a manager and two other employees still there right at closing time. They let all the uh, other employee or the, all the patrons had left and they pull out knives and a, what turned out it was a gun, but it turned out later that it was actually a BB gun that they had purchased from a local Walmart or Kmart or something. Anyway, they, they set about to robbing him. And so going by the policy, how many of you out there work in a restaurant or a hotel or some other place that caters to the public. And how many of your policies say something like, in the event of a robbery, do not make the robber mad. Comply com fully with them. Do what they want. Give them the money. Do not fight back. Blah, 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 blah. How many of your policies say things like that? And how many of your corporate policies strictly forbid you to possess any type of defensive tool? And we're not just talking about guns. We're talking about anything. And why are those there? Those are written by attorneys who don't ever actually think that they themselves would have to defend themselves against criminals. All they're worried about is lawsuits. And we'll, we'll talk about lawsuits in a second here. But what happened was is the manager and the and the two other employees did exactly what the corporate policy in the manual stated and what Sarah Brady would have you do. They fully complied with the robber's demands. They did everything that the robber said. They gave them the money. They didn't fight back. And keep in mind now, what we know after the fact is there was three victims and two bad guys, and the bad guys had a BB gun, pistol, and a knife, all right? Well... After they did, robbed them, they decided, well, there's not going to be any witnesses. So what they did is they walked them back into the walk-in cooler. They uh, they taped their hands together, you know, behind them. And then uh, the one guy pulled out a buck knife and started sawing their throats. And he killed all of them, slit their throats in there. So what was the rule? If for some unknown reason you haven't already began fighting back initially – if they're going to take you to a secondary crime scene, uh, yeah. do not let that happen. Exactly. The secondary crime scene rule, uh, if for whatever reason you've gotten caught flat-footed, 
uh, and and this goes right into it. You, you know, you're you're for you know somebody got into your area of operation, you didn't see it happen. Bam, uh, they they catch you between the car or in the in the lobby of the hotel or or the whatever, and they're going to rob you. They're going to take your wallet. They're going to take your phone. They're going to take your watch. Whatever, and then they decide all right, we're going back into the alley. We're going back into the walk-in freezer. We're going, let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, they're not taking you back there so they can sit you down and have a conversation with you. They're taking you back there to murder you so no one else will see it happen. That is the only reason why a criminal or a felon, a predator, would move you from the place where you are found to another place. If he was just going to take your wallet and haul ass Oops, I said that, but you're going to have to forgive me. Hall butt. If he's just going to take your wallet, your valuables, and run away, he would have done it. They're not going to hang around and wait for the police to show up and, and catch him in the act unless they have other plans. And what happened in Cracker Barrel, at the Cracker Barrel, is they had other plans. They took him back in the walk-in reefer, tied their hands together, and then slit their throats, killed all of them, murdered them over hundred and eighty seven dollars or something. And what were they doing? What what did the manager and the employees do? They did exactly what Sarah Brady said you should do. F- don't don't come you know, don't fight them. Look at the ground. Be a good little victim and they'll leave you alone. And how did that work out for them? And yeah, I know this is a this is a tough subject, but you know what? It's a tough world. And maybe you ne- need to let that image of Three women knelt down in a freezer in Cracker Barrel. It might have been two women and one man. I'll have to look at the story. Three individuals who complied fully, who followed the advice of their betters, the people who said that the worst thing you could possibly do is to fight back because you might get injured. Well, let me tell you what. If you fight back, you might get injured. If you don't fight back, you absolutely positively will be injured. And if you're not physically injured, you're going to be mentally injured for years and years and years to come. So start fighting back, America. It's time to start fighting back. I had a a job a couple years ago that their policy was no weapons or I I don't remember exactly what it said, but basically the gist of it was you couldn't have – I couldn't even have a knife, a folding knife there. Well, to me, my life is more important than my job, and that's all I'm going to say on that issue. Well, and and when it comes to liability, you need to ask yourself this. If you are – and people say, you know, they write in letters or they send us notes and they're like, well, what am I supposed to do? That's exactly what my my policy is where I work. Well, here's what I would do, and uh, I do this because I'm that kind of a guy. I would go to to your attorney. If you don't have an attorney right now, you're not paying attention to student of the gun, right? Right? Because we've told you that you need to find one. You need to have the phone number of one uh, in your phone all the time. But approach him and say, uh, what, what I want, what I need from you, this is the policy of my work. And what I essentially need is I need a uh, a complete a, a policy that states that uh, my employer accepts all responsibility for my safety and well-being, both going to and coming from and while I'm at work because they have purposely disarmed me. And no, this, this, is, this has happened. And it works. Actually, a guy I went to, a, you want to hear a really cool story? I'll tell you a really cool story. Many years ago, I was at the Tactical Defense Institute, and one of the other students at the uh, school was an attorney, and he worked for a large firm uh, in Cincinnati. And while he was at that firm, they came up with this new enlightened Brady campaign type policy that stated that uh, all employees uh, were forbidden by company policy to possess any type of firearm, weapon, blah, 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 even including in their vehicles, right? So this guy who was an attorney for this firm went ahead and uh, drafted up a letter that said essentially, and he took it to his his boss and said, okay, well, I I understand that policy and and I understand it is your right as a business owner to to put a policy in. But then we have to ask, all right, I'll come. I'll come back to that real quick. But he so he did. He said, "Okay, you assume all responsibility for my health, safety, and well-being. And if I am a victim of a violent crime, going to, coming from, or while at work, you are held responsible for that." 
And he's like, oh, oh, no way. I'm not signing this. I'm not. You can't you can't expect us to be responsible. He's like, ha ha. Well, you're telling me that not only while I'm at work, but also if I I'm a you know, I have a concealed carry permit and I can't leave my gun in my car while I'm working in here because it violates your company policy. So essentially, I can't be armed on my way to work while I'm at work or on my way home from work. So if anything happens to me during that time, it is your responsibility. 100 percent. You are liable for anything that happens to me. And they're like, uh, uh, well, the guy knew he'd been had. He knew that this law, that this attorney had turned it around on him and that he'd been had. And he's like, all right, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. So this guy got a waiver. He's like, he goes, I do. I carry. He goes, I have a gun. And he said, because they refused to sign that. Now, could they give you a hard time at work? Sure, they could. Could your boss make your life miserable for you? Sure, he could. Um, is your bot is your company policy uh, when you stop to get gas on the way home from work after pulling a double shift and uh, you get stabbed to death in the parking lot for your wallet because you're completely and totally unarmed? Uh, is your are you going to show the guy your your company policy? Oh, hang on! Before you stab me to death, I want you to see my company policy that says that I'm not allowed to have any kind of a weapon on me. So. You should just not harm me because it's my company policy. Why don't you just go get that shiny placard off of the door, the little no guns allowed sign? Why don't you go get that and, and show it to the guy? Why don't you show it to the guys at Cracker Barrel? They, they complied with their company policy. Now they're all dead. Show, show them that sign. Let, let them know. Folks, it's time to reach down and, and, do, and do a gut check. Maybe reach down a little lower and do a testicular check. Uh, if you, as a man, as an adult male in uh, the sound of my voice, have not undergone experimental surgery to have your testicles removed, you might want to think about that for a second. And before you just are reasonable and go along with it just because, ask yourself, why am I going along with this just because? Just because, because some attorney thinks that's a great idea? Mm, okay, rock on. Now, the next story we're going to talk about, this actually is, the subtitle is, Armed in My Own House? Are you paranoid? I'm not paranoid like you, Paul. I don't feel the need to have a gun on while I'm in my own house. Come on. Well, this story came to us uh, from Wisconsin, and it turns out that uh, it was, it was a, a couple and they were living out in out in the county, out in the country. You know, they had a very nice cabin. And the uh, husband, it was the middle of the day, and the husband hears the, uh, his uh, yellow lab, his golden retriever, uh, is going crazy, right? The dog's barking, and he runs outside to see what's up. And, we, and this comes to us from the Fox News uh, website. Goes to see what's up. And turns out that there's a black bear that is in the process uh, is going to attack his dog down at the end of the driveway. So the guy runs out and he's way, and he, and he even described it on the, on the video afterwards. He said, I ran out and I was waving my arms because in his mind, that's what you do is you wave your arms at the bear. And then the bear says, Oh, scary man with arms waved. I'll run away now. Well, the bear didn't run away. The bear looked looked from the dog to the man and saw the man and said, wow, you're bigger. You will fill my belly. So he attacked the homeowner. The homeowner turned and tried to run back into the cabin but wasn't able to. The bear jumped on his back, pushed him to the ground, and started clawing and biting him. And uh, they had to uh, they had to stitch his ear back on, and, he, and his, the back of his head was split open, and so forth. And they, when they interviewed him after he'd you know was out of the hospital and everything, and the, the news reporters got to him, they said, "Well, what were you thinking? And what was going through your mind?" And he said he was angry. He said, "I was angry that this was happening to me." And he said, "I wish I would have had a gun, but the gun was in the cabin." Well, the story doesn't end there, folks. The story continues because the uh, the story uh, or the the uh, Original title is woman, you know, woman who was it wife who can't load gun uses club, you know, clubs bear. It was essentially his wife hears him scream. You know, she hears what's going on. She grabs the shotgun to run outside and realizes that she doesn't know how to load the gun. 
So she can't load the gun. It's an empty gun, and she can't load it. So she runs over to the bear the, who's got her husband pinned down in the driveway now and is chewing on him, smashes the bear in the head with the gun. That distracts the bear, and he was like, what's up, lady? Let's the guy go. They scramble back, and they run into the cabin, lock the door, and they're like, okay, the bear will leave now. <laughs> the bear don't leave. The bear wants him. He's hungry. He's mad. He's rabid. I don't know what he is, but he's a wild animal. I do know that, and wild animals are very unpredictable. He decides he's try- he wants to get in this cabin. And uh, the wife here has got some, she's got some pictures of this black bear trying to get in the house. Well, according to the story, according to the news story, they call 911 and one hour later, one hour later, a sheriff's deputy arrives at their property the bear is still trying to get in the house. He shoots and kills the bear, and now they're testing to see if it was had, was rabbit or was just a mean, nasty bear or what the deal was. But think about it like that. What are, number, what are the lessons that we learned? There's a lot of lessons that we can learn from this one instance. Number one, if you have your pants on, you should be armed. If you, if you have your pants on and you're not armed, my question to you is why? And you say, well, even if this guy was, you know, armed, he probably would have just had a handgun or a pistol or something. Well, I would rather have a gun than no gun uh, if I needed one. Number two, teach your wife how to load the guns and make sure she knows where the defensive guns are. We've talked about this quite often uh, in Student of the Gun. We talk about the fire extinguisher gun. What is the fire extinguisher gun? Whether it's a rifle or a pistol or a shotgun, the fire extinguisher gun is that gun that is kept loaded and ready, and all the responsible adults in the household know where the gun is and they know how to use it. So that in the middle of a crisis, when a bear is trying to eat your face off, your wife doesn't think have to run around and think, I don't even know how to load this thing. Huh? And uh, what else did we learn? Go ahead, Jared. What did the news say? That it wouldn't have mattered anyway because all they had was birdshot, so that wouldn't have done anything? Yeah. <laughs> well, and then you were watching the news clip, and the, and the little news anchorette chick, she says, she looks at the guy, she goes, well, apparently all they had was bird loads anyway, and it wouldn't have done any good. Let me tell you what, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, if if the bear was 20 yards away from me and you fired number seven shot into it, it's probably just going to annoy the bear and he's going to wonder why you did that. If you're close enough to a bear that you can hit it with the butt of the gun or if you can club it with the gun, you're close enough to put the muzzle right up to his little furry head and press the trigger. And bird shot or not, you put the muzzle of a 20-gauge shotgun, and in the story that we have up here, it says it was a 20-gauge. You put the muzzle of a 20-gauge shotgun up to the up to Boo Boo's little fuzzy ear and press the trigger, and I don't care if it's a trap load. It's going to get his attention. Uh, so there's that. Now, what do we know about this whole hour? They're waiting. They're in the house. They're waiting for a sheriff's deputy to show up to, uh, to kill the bear so they can get out because where do they need to go? Well, did we forget about the husband? The husband is bleeding like a like a crazy per- I mean, he's bleeding all over the place. They uh, in the story it said that they, they used like 17, 20 something. They had to sew his ear back onto his head. They had to staple the back of his head closed, the back of his scalp down to his neck. They had to staple it closed because of the injuries. And he survived, and yay, go team. But what if that would have been a no-kidding, life-threatening injury that if you don't get medical treatment in the next you know, 15 minutes, you're going to die? What if it had been one of those situations? Here we are in the house. There's a crazy rabid bear or whatever outside of the house. We can't get to the car to get, a, you know, to, get to help, to get medical help, because there's a bear here, and we don't have anything to do uh, – to do it, you know, to deal with it. And what is the, the, I guess the, so what do we got? We should know, number one, we should uh, always be armed. Number two, we need to teach our wife to be armed or at least have the fire extinguisher gun that every responsible adult in the house knows where it is. What else? Uh, medical training. Yep. Check. We need that. What else? What do we know about 911? 911 is fine. 911 gets help on the way. 
It's not instantaneous help. And some places in this world, it's just going to take a while. And uh, that's the that's the way the world is, folks. We can't park police officers at the end of everybody's driveway uh, or fire trucks or ambulances or what have you. So it took an hour for a police officer to get there. What if it would have been three crackheads that were smashing in the door? What if it wouldn't have been a bear? It had been three uh, evil, nasty villain type people uh, that were trying to get in here. And we dialed 911. The police would have just come and cleaned up the scene afterwards. Uh, so there's a lot of things we can learn from this. Be armed, even at home. And you say, well, I don't live in bear country. Well, whatever. How many times have you heard, have the dog barked? Or, you know, the dog's outside and he's freaking out. You don't know why. So what do you do? You run outside. And what if there's a problem out there that requires a firearm and your firearm's inside the house? Now you're standing out in the front lawn. Hang on a sec. I'll be right back. Let me go arm myself. That doesn't work like that. Uh, your spouse is or should be your partner in home defense. If your spouse doesn't know how to use a firearm, shame on you. You you need to teach them how to use a firearm. They need to be capable. And, you know, they're your partner, you know, in, in self-defense, in home defense. Don't don't be the – we talked about this before, but don't be that, that man like, oh, thump my chest, I'm the man. Well, what if the man needs some help? Sometimes the man needs some help, okay? Uh, so there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that right there. And it doesn't have to be bear country. It could be coyotes, bobcats, not bobcat necessarily, but cougars, you know, wolves, bears, whatever. And, yeah, and for all of you fuzzy little I love boo-boo type people, black bears can and will kill you and eat you. Look up statistics on black bear attacks. There's actually more black bear attacks in the United States of America than any other type of bear. So if you live in an area like, well, there's there's no grizzlies or brown bears where I live, so I'll be okay. <laughs> uh, all right, whatever. Yeah, you, know, you you can hopefully you'll live with that. Now the last story we've got to talk about. This is another go team story, and this just occurred uh, recently. Uh, death row inmate. Escape, or I don't know if he's a death row inmate. He was a bad man. He was a, he was a felon, a convicted uh, felon, escaped from prison in Iowa. And uh, everybody was looking for this guy, and he ended up in the home of a retired couple. He took them hostage and uh, in their own home. But the husband, Mr. Jerome, Mr. Jerome was able to get a shotgun and put an end to this piece of human debris. So after being uh, after being essentially kidnapped in their own home, held hostage by this uh, piece of human debris that all the police were looking for, uh, the hero here in uh, Taylor County, Iowa, uh, the dateline is Bedford, Iowa, and we got this from KETV.com News. He was able to turn the tables on the escaped inmate, use his own firearm, and shoot the bad guy. So... What we have to say for our guy right there is go team, way to be armed. And uh, just because you are a senior or a seasoned citizen does not mean you should not be armed. You should be armed, and we applaud that, and we're glad that he was. And uh, we, we, we're we familiar. We just became aware here this week a couple of days ago, actually it was yesterday, of a situation that occurred uh, in, out west. I believe it was Washington where a a retired a retired uh, um, World War II veteran uh, just died. And I, I was literally just reading that story, and I was about to mention it. Okay, well, go ahead and drop it into the show notes then. Uh, but what we know is is two young pieces of human trash uh, just decided that it, I don't know for whatever reason that that this uh, this veteran this World War II veteran eighty nine years old uh, was leaving the Eagles walking out and they were going to attack him and beat him and they beat him mercilessly and he just died. And there's been a lot of stuff this week that we've become aware of. Uh, there was a situation in Memphis, Tennessee, where three individuals uh, rode down, basically went and, and shot to death uh, a lone uh, person just because. Because they were bored. Because they were well, that that wasn't that wasn't the Memphis one. That was the Oklahoma one. Oh, you said Memphis. Yeah. Yeah. I was just no, saying. there's two instances this week. In a span of one week, we had two instances where three bad people, just because they wanted to, murdered uh, individuals. And why are we just finding out? 
Well, well my, that's, my, that's my question. My question to you guys is, do you believe in your heart of hearts that the villains, that the vile, that the nasty people of this world right now in uh, 2013, do you believe that they are more restrained than they ever have been? Or do you believe that they're more emboldened than they have ever been? Ask yourself that. The people that would do you harm, are they more emboldened now than they ever have been? Uh, do they believe that there are going to be enough Jesse Jacksons and Al Sharptons and, you know, apologists, Sarah Brady's and, and their ilk, Gabby Giffords, ugh, all these people that are going to come out and say, you need to be disarmed so that, you know, that the violence will end. No, actually, if you're disarmed, the violence will increase. And what we've seen over the last two to three weeks is an uptick and an increase in random unsolicited violence. All of you folks out there who think, well, you know, I, I've talked to these people before and they'll say, well, I don't go to places where I would need a gun. You know, I don't go to bars. I don't stay out late at night. I don't go to the seedy parts of town. None of these instances occurred because the people in question had bad judgment and went to the bad part of town or went somewhere they shouldn't have been. One of the guys was jogging. So he should have known better than to jog down the street that day. That was his fault for jogging down the street. Uh, our World War II veteran there, he should have known better than to go to the Eagles that day and then leave. You know, he should have known better than to do that. Uh, people that tell you that, people that say, well, as long as you don't go to the wrong neighborhoods. Well, what in the world is the wrong neighborhood? That that insults me. I mean, that really insults me as just as a thinking person. So what you're telling me is that you know that a certain area is plagued with crime and villainy and vermin. And we just accept that? Is that what we do now, Jared? We just accept it? Apparently in these times. Um, so that's like saying, well, you know, uh, right over there, there's a lot of poison, uh, but we just, we don't go by it. Uh, we know that there's poison over there, or, or let's say, uh, we know that this one neighborhood has some radioactivity in it and our solution is just to not go there. We're not going to clean up the radioactive waste or the toxic waste. We just know that it's there. I think toxic waste, Jared. You think that's the best analogy? Yeah, toxic waste. I like okay. That. So let's say you've got a, an area of the city that you live in or that you inhabit and a uh, tanker truck spills and it pours, you know, uh, toxic waste out into the street. So the solution is just to block off or cordon off those streets forever. Not for a day, not for a week, just forever. And tell people, well, you know, there's a lot of toxic waste over there in that area. You probably want to avoid it. Well, are we going to clean it up? No, we're not going to clean it up. Well, we told you it was there. So just avoid it. What? Really? So you're telling me that certain neighborhoods or certain areas are unsafe for human travel. And the solution is just don't go there. What? So what happens when those areas that are unsafe for human travel, what happens when they go from being one square block to two to four to eight to ten to becoming the entire city of Chicago? What happens then? They become D.C. They become New York. They become Philadelphia. They become Detroit. So... What started out as a small little area full of toxic waste because we don't have the fortitude or the courage as citizens. We don't have the fortitude to hold our uh, lawmakers responsible. We, we can't hold them responsible because holding anyone responsible is somehow cruel and, and mean and insensitive. So you have an area that is just that one area that you shouldn't go to. Well, it grows and it grows and it becomes the city of Chicago. It becomes the city of Detroit. It becomes Washington, D.C. That's what happens when you just ignore the problem. When you leave the toxic waste and your solution to the toxic waste is just don't go there. Well, 
we've had we've had enough of the just don't go there. Is it not time that we demand that we clean up the toxic waste? Is it not time? I don't know. Ask yourself that. You're a student of the gun. You should be a smart person. You should be an intelligent person. Hey, you found this this show. You found Student of the Gun Radio. So that tells me, at very least, you've got a little bit of G2. That's military lingo for intelligence. Speaking of toxic waste, I'm kind of scrolling on the Student of the Gun Facebook here, and a story popped up that says, Obama administration sues Texas, claims voting ID requirements are racist. But that that's... I kind of went ADD on you for a second. That's not my point there. <laughs> my what point, is your point? My point is that if you don't like Student of the Gun on Facebook, you should. And in addition to liking us on Facebook, I would like to make Student of the Gun, hashtag Student of the Gun, a trending topic on Twitter. So if you can do that for us, if any any conversations that you have on Twitter, um, talk about Student of the Gun and at the end of it, put hashtag Student of the Gun. And if you guys do that, I'll I'll be so happy. And we always want to make sure that we're keeping Jared happy because that is our goal in life is to keep Jared happy. So um, I like that goal. You like that goal? You you appreciate that? You support it one hundred percent? I do. I support that one hundred percent. Jared supports the Keep Jared Happy campaign one hundred percent. One more ADD moment. Uh oh, he's got one more ADD. Speaking moment. Speaking of supporting one hundred percent, tomorrow Student of the Gun is going to be going to Starbucks. The entire crew. That's right. Thank you for reminding me of that. And we're going to do a special support Starbucks Saturday um, homeroom video. So tune in to studentofthegun.com slash homeroom tomorrow evening. And I will work tirelessly for you guys to get that video up on the website. (laughs) You heard him. He said he's going to work tirelessly. Yes, that's right. Uh, uh, By the time you hear the sound of our voices, unfortunately, we we weren't quite hip to this uh, a week ago. We just actually were made aware of it uh, within the last couple of days. Uh, But uh, we are going to go to Starbucks and show our support for them because essentially it's as simple as this. Starbucks, you know, has been they're being bullied by the Brady campaign and their ilk. And they're trying to force Starbucks to put up these ridiculous placards in their in their coffee shops that say, you can't have a gun here. And Starbucks, they came out with a very responsible corporate statement. And their statement was, we will abide by whatever the law is in the state that we have our stores. If the state of Mississippi says you're allowed to carry, then you're allowed. You know, if the city of New York says you're not, then you're not. We will follow the law of. But if you're a Brady bully. If you're one of these bullies that, that want to force your way on everybody else, that's not good enough. So they're doing a skip Starbucks Saturday. Well, I tell you, apparently these folks are slow learners because the last time they pulled this horse garbage, uh, was it Valentine's Day? I don't, I don't remember. The one that comes to my mind is the Chick-fil-A thing where... They, yeah, that backfired on them. Yeah, that backfired. Was that was was that the Brady campaign? That wasn't no, it wasn't Brady campaign. That was that something was else. Other hippies. But anyway... Um, yeah, it was it was I believe I'm almost positive that it was Valentine's Day. I think it was February that they decided to uh to go ahead and, and boycott Starbucks. And you guys, you folks out there in the audience, and whether or not you like Starbucks coffee, I don't really care. The fact is is right now in, in this year two thousand thirteen, it is hard to find people that will reach down and uh gut check and uh, stand up to these bullies. And we're going to be standing up to these bullies tomorrow. I've spent my entire adult life standing up to bullies, whether they were the enemies of this nation, whether they were local bullies, whether they were street bullies, whether they were organized crime bullies uh, when I was a bodyguard. I've spent my entire adult life standing up to bullies, and I don't back down to them, and I don't want you to back down to them either. Start standing up to the bullies because that's the only way that they can get away with it. That is the only way that they can cow all these business owners and reasonable people in the world is to bully them, and I'm not putting up with it, and you shouldn't either. So even if you hear this and you're like, well, that day has already passed, that's fine, Uh, I would, you know, if, if you get the opportunity, if you like Starbucks coffee, hey, don't you don't have to buy a coffee. They got really cool donuts and stuff, or pastries and breads, and you know, there's all there, there's something in that store that you would want to put in your mouth. I guarantee it, right? So uh, check out Starbucks and and uh, you know, I would give them I'll give them a thumbs up. And we're going to be out tomorrow. We're actually going to go to the one in Gulfport probably, and uh, and su- and show our support to those guys over there. So if you have the opportunity, take a moment and show them your support. 
Now, don't forget, before we wrap up, and I would be remiss if I did not mention it, make sure that you're always going to studentofthegun.com to check out all of the new articles, uh, all the stuff that we've got on the gear store, the T-shirts. We've got T-shirts in stock. We've got the stickers and what have you. Uh, We also, now don't forget, we are on Sunday nights, Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, channel 266 on Dish Network. So if you want to set your DVRs and watch it so you can sit in your big recliner and watch it on your big screen TV, that would be fantastic. Uh, Otherwise, you can always watch. You can catch the show material or the archive material directly on studentofthegun.com. Oh, and, you know, Jared's always thanking you guys uh, for responding and doing the social media stuff. But I want to to thank you guys out there. Thank you listeners who have actually, especially the iTunes folks who have taken a moment on iTunes to rate the show. And uh, I appreciate that. And you guys this week, a bunch of folks have gone on and have rated the show. So if you are an iTunes dude or a dudette and you appreciate what we're doing here at Student of the Gun, go ahead and take a moment and give us a rating if you would, because uh, iTunes does look at that very closely. And that's how they rate their shows in ranking. Anything else we need to talk about before we let these folks get back? Um, Get off your treadmill, go take a shower, (laughs) whatever you need to do. I think I've pretty much beat the the social media horse. Yeah, don't say social media again. Someone's going to riot and they're going to come and get you. Well, if they riot, at least mention Stu to the Gun while you're rioting. Exactly. I always want to do that. <laughs> we want to we want to thank our our good friends at Crossbreed Holsters up in Republic, Missouri, and of course our good friends uh, at Keltec and down there in Cocoa, Florida. Don't forget about them, and don't forget about our other friends on the Firearms Radio Network. Don't forget about those guys. Check out the other shows, and remember that you're a beginner once, but you should always be a student for life.